Uh, hi everyone. Good morning. Selamat pagi. All right. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Uh, I know it's a busy day every day. Uh, so thank you so much for for just taking the time. So I thought let's. Uh, it's a very interesting week, yeah. <laughs> somehow, somehow when I decided to come this week, I, I forgot there was an election. Week, right? But, but never mind, you know. So I've been here for the last four elections, right? Since uh, so it was good to experience. But hey, you know, putting all things aside, I mean, it's uh, we should be grateful. It was a. Uh, you know, it was a peaceful democracy in the sense of election. There was no, no fighting, no, no people getting hurt. You know, because we see this in a lot of countries, right? It's a lot of burning, shooting, killing. You know, it's because Z came along. <laughs> <laughs> and this year, there's a lot of uh, debate of uh, world wars here. Yeah? So, but hey, you know, life goes on. All right. Okay, Dian, do we have the, the papers and the markers to be passed around? Yes, see. Yeah. Okay, all right. So since it's very early in the morning, everybody's trying to wake up, you're pumping up with your coffee, so let's stand up and let's have a short game, yeah? Right, right, let's stand up. I will join Yes, you have done. I need your help at the front. Yeah. Okay. So, let's start. Okay. 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 So I have two coins. So me and Diaz will flip each one. Yeah. So it's going to be either head or tails. Yeah. <coughs> so you are going to try and guess what are we going to flip by showing it using your body. All right. So if it's head, it's like this. Two heads, yeah. This is two tails. <laughs> If it's a head or tail, oh, one head, one tail. So you need to decide. Me and Dian will flip the coin. We will tell you the result. If you get it right, you stand. If you don't get it right, you sit down and enjoy your coffee. Ah. <laughs> we'll see who's the last one standing. All right? Okay, ready? So, okay, pick, select. You need to decide. Alright, either like this, yeah. like this, or like this. Alright, okay. Ready? One, two, three. What is it? Two heads. Yeah. So if your head, you keep standing. If you got it wrong, you sit down. How many standing? Okay, three years, uh, four years, wow. All right, again, one, two, three. Okay, let them decide first. Let's make sure. Head and tail. Okay, let's do it again. One, two, three. Head and tail. Head and tail. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. So, 
So we must give a winner something, right? Yeah. 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 So uh, healthy candy. Yeah, so there's enough for you to share with everyone, okay? <laughs> Alright, okay, so today what are we going to talk about? <laughs> so today I thought we'll talk a little bit about the universal design for learning. Alright, so you're probably very familiar with this to a certain extent. Alright? So, when you prepare your Canvas courses, usually, I think Ibudesi will send you something like a, what's called a checklist, right? And then she'll say, check your courses with the checklist. And I've done that, but one of the things we haven't really done was, what is that checklist? Where does it come from, right? So we look for some things in the checklist and make sure those things are highlighted and it's also in your course. All right, so we'll do a little bit of that and then you're going to do a little bit of work, just a little bit, not too much. Uh, and then we'll have a bit of reflection and then we'll do some Q&A. So that's the goal today, all right? So, so the objective is very simple, just three things. A deeper understanding of UDL. So you've been exposed to it. Uh, So I think you've been exposed to this, and the last few days I've been visiting different classes and uh, having fun, uh, you know, sitting in some of these classes, and I can see some of these things are being put into practice, right? So it's already there. So today I thought it would be good uh, just to take a deeper dive, a little bit of uh, what UDL exactly is, so we understand where it comes from. And then we'll look at some of the key principles of UDL so that the checklist will make more sense to you. Like, oh, okay, I understand why these things are important. And lastly, we'll do a little bit of application by doing something fun so we can, like, let's see if I were to do something and use UDL, how would it look like? What considerations will I make? All right, so that's the three objectives for today. So, Universal design for learning. So, anyone wants to give it a try, what do you think it is? Anyone? About this? Yeah. So, what's your understanding of what universal design for learning is? Um, I'm not sure about the term universal because okay. actually it actually says something about people are different. People okay. Are different Learning, yeah, yeah, yeah. Things should be uh, conducted in class and something like that. But actually, I'm not sure about this term universal. Yeah, why does the word universal comes from, right? <laughs> 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 All right, okay. Anyone else? Like you, you've read about it or you've seen it somewhere. What do you think universal design for learning is? I just uh, remember that one of our Yeah, yeah, sure. uh, I, I thought uh, one class, uh, economics and human factors, we discussed. 
discuss about uh, universal design for products. Ah, so, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, in this term, we, uh, we, 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 let's, if we break part word by word, universal it will be more just related to uh, how uh, some things can be accepted in general population, for example. Mm -hmm. And then uh, design will be uh, planning uh, some things for doing uh, some functionality. So universal design is like about planning things, it can be services, it can be products uh, that can be accepted in general population. So it, it, in this case for learning, perhaps we're trying to generate some concept of learning that can be accepted by many uh, various uh, types of people. Fantastic, so all of you have, you know, you, 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 uh, you are right, basically, right? You, you captured some aspects of what you can do. Yeah, but yeah, I remember uh, Stephen Stando used to introduce us with the universal design ah. learning. It's a uh, kinds of applications. What's that? Actually, they kinds of like suggestions if we want to, for example, provide feedback. What activities? There are lots of uh, applications. Uh, they have provided that suggestions actually for us to go there and also to mm. uh, including, for example, feedback, evaluation, and also lots of uh, how to design the teaching and okay. more. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. So basically, to put it simply, I mean, universal design, as you see in engineering, in uh, urban planning, in product design, uh, in, in architecture, you hear this word, universal design, universal design, right? So again, it is a framework. Yeah, it's a framework. So. What is a framework then? Okay, so a framework is basically a set of principles or beliefs, right? So you, universal design for learning is a framework, so it's a set of principles or beliefs. So where does it come from? Where is it based on? So I think that's the question we want to answer, right? Because in, in, uh, if we talk about an uh, architecture building, so we want to make the building accessible for everyone. Somebody on a wheelchair, somebody that is, uh, has a disability, someone who has no sight, and also for people who may not have disabilities, but may have, you know, you may have a pram that you're pushing, right? You may have three kids. Is, is the building safe for children? So you're considering all the things when you, you, you talk about architecture, right? So what does it look like? if it's for learning, right? What is universal design for learning looks like? So, this is the definition. So it's basically a framework that guides the planning of learning based on neuroscience. That will enable learners to be purposeful, motivated, resourceful and knowledgeable, strategic, so it's a framework basically that is based on neuroscience. So what that means is we design learning based on how we understand the brain function and works. Okay, it's generalized. It doesn't mean that the brain will always work like that. You know, the brain is very complex. But having some understanding of how our brain captures information. You now something I learned about three weeks ago, I think, it really blew my mind. It's, it's like, you know, you, you kind of find out something that you never knew and you're like, whoa, that's like a big revelation. So I never knew that the retina at the back that which captures uh, the light is actually part of the brain. Oh, really? Yeah. It's the only part of the brain that resides outside the cranial the, the, the bone, yeah. So it's an extension. So no wonder what you see actually goes as a direct access to your brain, right? So when you talk about focus, attention, why is it so powerful, right? Why is it so easy to be distracted? Because it has direct access to your brain, unlike other parts of your body where the signal is to be sent, right, and filtered. But the eye is actually an extended part of your brain. 
and I never did that. Okay? So that was mind blowing. So it makes sense, a lot of things I studied in psychology, why it works the way it works, because hey, you know, the vision has a direct access, right? And why is that important? In evolution, it makes perfect sense, right? You need, the, the, the eye is not only for you to see, right? To see shapes, color, it's not only for that. It's also to keep you safe, to, for you to be alert, to be aware of your surroundings. So that signal needs to have a direct access to your brain. Back in those days, if you're in the plains, you know, you, you're looking around, what are you looking for? Right, you're looking for food, but you're also keeping an eye for the threat. Now, today as human beings, we don't expect so much more threat back in those days because you don't see wild animals roaming, or you know, there's the police force. So, but yet, that brain still functions the same way it does, right? So these threats or you know, sometimes we look at someone, an individual, we see them as a threat, right? It creates the same response in your brain, right? That's why you freeze, or you get scared, or you can't do something. So that was a big revelation to me. So that's what neuroscience does, right? So some understanding of how things work helps us to, to do better design, all right? So in this case, it's a framework, it's a set of principles and beliefs, and where does it come from? It comes from neuroscience. So let's look at that a little bit so that this diagram that I think you should have received in a while that I will show. So you as an instructor, when you look at your learners sometimes, the problem is when we look at them, we, we look at them, uh, they must be the same. <laughs> They're all circles, maybe a bit of different color, and some, you may even think, they probably are like me, right? Maybe just different color, right? But they are like me. And sure enough, there will be one student just like you, you know, maybe as smart as you, or probably smarter than you, right? You will see these kids. So what we do is, we'll find an average and we'll say, okay, let me prepare this lesson for the average, right? But the actual reality is, what we prepare, your students are like this, <laughs> oh. right? You get all kinds of shapes. None of them looks like you. And then you average this, all these shapes, you get a shape that doesn't exist. Mm. So how do you prepare for this? So that's our challenge, right? That's the challenge for us as instructors. How do I so there's a very, very interesting story that I read. In the late 1940s, a lot of planes in the US, especially the Air Force planes, were crashing. In fact, there was a particular month, about 12 planes crashed. So they couldn't figure out what was wrong. Obviously, there's something wrong. So a lot of it to do that with the pilot uh, losing control of the plane. So they're trying to figure out what was going on, right? What, why, why are there so many crashes and what was happening? So this is what, so obviously they opened up the investigation and they found out this. It was the cockpit. So they said, so the design principle was like this. Let's take all these pilots, let's measure them, average them, and then we'll build a cockpit for the average. But the problem was, <laughs> later on when the crashes happened and when they investigated, they found out they took all the 493 pilots, measured them, and none of them met the average. None of them, so it wasn't fit. So, so here's the design flaw, right? Let's, let's design for the average pilot. But the flaw it was the average. The average was the flaw because it doesn't fit anyone. So everybody, like when they sit, is either too far, too near. So they were struggling to control the plane, right? Because back in those days, you don't fly by wire, all right? 
it's not fully electronic. I mean, you still need to like, you know, <laughs> do all the stuff. And they were having trouble controlling the blades. That's why the crashes were happening. So what did they do? They made it flexible, right? So today, that same design principle you have it in your cars, right? Yeah. When you sit in your car, your wife has a, mm -hmm. she has a seating arrangement, right? <laughs> She will adjust, and you know, nowadays you have cars where you can actually lock in the location, right? Like, and then you sit in, your legs are longer, so you want a different, and then you can lift the steering wheel. So that, that's what they did. You see, but back then, that was a revelation. <laughs> so imagine if today we don't build cars like that, right? We don't build motorbikes like that. We, we, we design differently. So it's the same principle goes back to teaching. So if we pick an average and just teach to that average, it doesn't work. You will fail, right? Why? You know, nothing goes through because there's no average. Everyone is, you know, they are, they are like, you know, if you, if you uh, do the statistics away from the average, right? All over the place, but the average. So that's where, Universal design for learning comes in because we we change the way we design. So this is a ramp, right? You've seen this. Who is it built for? Disabled. Yeah, wheelchair, right? We when we see this, we have in mind this is for wheelchair, right? But who does it benefit? Everybody. Everyone, right? Mummies with prams will use it. You probably, a young person, you probably broke your leg <laughs> like soccer or football, right? You will use it, yeah. knee problem, right? It look okay, but I have a knee problem. Yeah. I will use it. So that's the purpose of design. So how do we design something that makes it accessible for everyone, right? The, 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 the fit person can benefit, right? And even the, uh, even the least, uh, competent can also benefit from, from my design. So that's the essence of what universal, so what most of you mentioned was true, right? It's designing or reducing barriers so that everyone can access the knowledge. We forget sometimes we are the experts, right? You spend your whole life writing papers, <laughs> right? studying this in depth. So, you, you are absolutely at a different level when you get these kids who are coming for undergraduate courses, right? I mean, they're like, they have no clue, right? So how do you make your knowledge accessible to them? I think that's the key thing. So think of the ramp when you're designing your lessons, right? How can I make it accessible? Is this accessible for everyone? So going back to this, it's based on neuroscience. So how does it work? So basically they look at three networks, right? So the first is the, uh, so when you, when our sensors, our sensors are sensory, right? Whether what we hear, what we see, usually it goes to the back of the brain, right? Remember I told you it has a direct access your retina, right? So basically what you see, the visuals, what you hear goes to the back of the brain, right? That's where the, the signals are decoded first. Next, it's sent to the affective network, which is in the center of the brain, where the hippocampus is. So what does that do? That's the part that controls motivation, interest, right? So when I walk into your class, what's the hook? Right? Why should I be interested in your class? So that's what students are thinking, the why, right? Why, why should I sit in your class? Why should I listen to you for the next two hours? Right, I, I, miss, I sat in classes that were one hour, 15 minutes, one hour, 45 minutes, but there are also classes that last for two hours and 30 minutes, right? So these are very long classes. So why should I sit there, invest my time, so that, that's the hippocampus, right? So that's the part that, the why of learning, all right? What is how you represent the data, 
right? How you represent the knowledge that you're putting across. There are different classes. There are classes with words, language. There are classes with, uh, you know, I attended the classes of a matrix class. There was a lot of numbers all over the place, right? Very heavy notations and scientific symbols. So it varies. So how do I represent all this data and make it available for the student also matters. Because if you just use one way of representing the data, then it makes it inaccessible for lots of people. Maybe a language student, when they see, they see text, they brim with joy, right? They love text. They love language, <laughs> right? right? Yesterday I was in the I was sitting in an Indonesian class, right? So one of the students did a presentation, right? And then he finished his presentation with a pantone. Oh, I mean this is classic, right? I mean he's, <laughs> we, we love our pantones, right? <laughs> so when he recited his pantone, the whole class erupted in like, yeah. you know, they were like so happy. <laughs> right. Was it, you, you should you should you should have been there. It was such a high energetic, the class was full, everybody from the front to the back were engaged, right? Why? Because of that one element, the design of the, the design of the, uh, the task, it was so accessible to everybody, it was so contextual, everybody was engaged. There's one student who walked in with no bag, nothing on him, and he was wearing sandals. And he came right to the back and he said, I thought, my goodness, what's wrong with this guy, right? He's, he's, but interestingly, he was the most engaged kid. <laughs> Answering every question at the back, analyzing every text. So he was, I mean, kudos to the teacher, yeah? I mean, she, she, there was more than 20 students and every single one of them were engaged, right? Because of the design of the task. I think that one thing made it. Right? Learning was happening. I I wasn't taking note. I was so absorbed. I was asking questions, learning along. Oh, okay, this is how you do this. It was so amazing, right? Because she she's got the why of learning, right? And then of course the strategic network right at the end, how you demonstrate learning and understanding, that's the prefrontal cortex, right? So this is where Memory is encoded, sent to the long-term memory, you remember it, you make relations. So, when I say UDL is based on neuroscience, this is what it means. It is based on these three broad networks. So, I, I think you should have this diagram. This should have been sent to you, right? Usually when I look at things like this, I don't like too much text. <laughs> Too many things. So how do I encode all this, right? So, so let's go through this very quickly. So what this means. So the top part is the networks, right? Remember, I told you the three networks. UDL is a framework. It's a set of beliefs and principles which is based on neuroscience. It's based on how our brain works, how information comes in, gets decoded, encoded, right? From short-term memory to long-term memory, and what I can do at every stage. So that's the three networks. So it's the engagement network, which is very important. All right, the representative station network, which is how you represent the content, uh, the skills that the students need to learn, and how you represent them. <coughs> the last one is action and representation, which is where how students demonstrate, do they have a choice? Can they choose to decide to show, to demonstrate their skills? Okay, so that's, now, it's, it's arranged in a linear way, but we know learning doesn't happen in a linear way, but it kind of like when we plan, it goes from left to right. Okay, so that's UDL. Okay, so those are the three principles we talked about. What's next? At the bottom, three goals. When I address each one of these networks, what's my goal? The first one, expert learners who are purposeful and motivated. 
meaning they can learn over time by being in your class to be self-regulated. Right? Because they are so motivated, they will plan their learning. You tell them, I want you to do this, they will figure out, okay, I need to do this by this time, and I will do it this way, and I will present it this way. And this is what how I understand about that. So they become self-regulated over time, right? Because they are motivated. That's why the hook is important. If they are not hooked, then you've lost them from day one, right? They are like, so you have all that symptoms, right? Come for class late, right? Don't show up, you know? They just try to, they keep, they have an Excel sheet. Their Excel sheet is how many classes they should attend so that they meet the minimum requirement, right? So it becomes like that. When the class is engaged, everybody is there before the class, right? They are ready. They've done their homework. They are ready to go. And then they have opinions, right? So that's, that's when you know you've got them, right? And I definitely did see that this week. So what's in the middle? So these are the three goals. So what's in the middle? So in the middle is what we call guidelines with checkpoints. So how do I meet the requirement of the network so that I can achieve this goal at the bottom? There are some guidelines, right? Do you have to hit every one of them every time you plan your lesson? No. But these are some guidelines that you can look at. So that's the checklist that you get. That's where it comes from. Right? So, you access, you build, and you internalize. Right? So that's the three stages. So when you are designing your lesson, you try to progress through this. Okay, so this is another version of it. I will send it to you. So I like this version because it's simplified. Right? <laughs> no need all that checklist. It's more visual, right? So this is an example of how you take a text-heavy content and you simplify it for the students. This, I can read, right? You do a text dump, I'm like, okay, I'm out of here, all right? <laughs> I'm checking out, right? So, so you recruit interest, you sustain the effort that leads to self-regulation. So that's the engagement part, all right? I'll make sure that I send this to you as well. All right, let's have a short quiz. What are the three main networks of UDM? Can I have three people share one of the networks? Yes, but I remember the effective networks. Effective networks. The why? The why? Okay. Why students should come to my class? Okay. Is it to see me singing? <laughs> <laughs> or to see me uh, uh, yelling? <laughs> to enjoy the knowledge. Yes. The why yes. is very yeah. important. Yeah. 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 Right? So that's the hippocampus and the amygdala, right? In the middle of part of your brain. That's where the motivation is. Yeah. Right? Okay, fantastic. Two more networks. Yes. Uh, Without looking at your notes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many notes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to figure out the Network, like ah, okay. On the uh, how, because I think that how I yes. do it in my class of, of speech, I show them how to correct, correct to to do the actions and do the expressions and stuff, and I'm hoping that the, they are doing it. Correct, correct. So the, the reinforcement, right? Yeah. So what am I doing now? I'm doing what we call reassert. It's not the best way to. To solidify learning, but from time to time it's good to ask a question, right? Because, and don't just say any questions and then move on to your next slide, yeah. right? You gotta say questions, wait, mm -hmm. two minutes, because nobody will, like, any questions, <laughs> nobody does that, right? <laughs> so you gotta say questions, wait, and after a while you see one hand go up or you see some doubt, hey, you have a question? Ah. Okay, so again, so 
that's the second network. That's where you know you, you you put it into practice. You demonstrate, let's say, public speaking, and it gets encoded in long-term memory, right? Because when you stand up, you speak, you use your arms, and you know everything gets built, right? Okay, one more network. Yes, we need compensation in the back. <laughs> Sometimes you need a reinforcement of speech plus some visuals and some hands-on. You put all together, then the learning happens. If you take one element out, the learning gets disrupted. Then only good students will benefit. Right? If I'm a student good in math, sometimes I see the equation on your slide, I know what's happening, right? Do you know students like that? Right? They say, ah, okay. But then you have students looking, the eyes popping out, like no clue what's going on, right? So how do you help them? You have to show them. Papa, this is very important. Yeah. Um, the representation is changing every year. Correct. The time when I have the very smart group of SABS students. Yes, yeah. It was easy to find the, uh, this is the benefit of you attending my class. Yeah. And I thought that it will work again next year. Then different board. But different board changed, the SRB is gone. Then these students, culinary students, sport, have a different interest. Yeah, yeah. A different representation. The benefit for them is also different. Yeah. Because they're coming maybe from, well, a middle up uh, uh, family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're not really, yeah. you know, struggling, but yeah. him, himself, right, they're right. thinking of, you know, this is something that every year I have to first understand each kid in my class. They are the very genius one, and they, they, they there's also some where they okay come here because my father asked me. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah, yeah. so artistic now. Yeah, yeah. So, so I agree, right? I think that's a common challenge for us anywhere, right? So the question really is, whose fault is it? Is it the kid's fault, right? Right? Like, kids are the way they are because of their upbringing, their exposure, right? So, we can look at it as, uh, let's say, okay, this is, the, like, we can see this as barriers for us, right? And say, how can I reduce the barriers? So that's why every part of the network is important. Maybe I. Instead of saying, oh, the kids in my class are not engaged, they're not interested. I'm not saying you're wrong. Maybe they are like that because they are they're more privileged. Well, the SAPS kids, yeah, I'm so happy, I'm so grateful to be here, right? So that itself <laughs> makes a difference. But again, you can look at it like that, or you can say, how can I, what can I do to create engagement with this kind of kids. I know they are not interested. I know what you mean, because I used to teach in a Vinu Simpo. Yeah? This is the upper 2% of the society, yeah? Right? When they have birthday parties, I have, uh, I have uh, helpers carry cakes, like carrying the Egyptian king, you know? The cake is so big, four or five people have to carry it like this. That's the kind of school I am, and, and I have very privileged kids. 
but I can't see it as a barrier for me. Ah, I can't teach this kid. So I need to reduce the barriers, go through those networks, and change them, right? The self-regulation, the executive functions. And there were many things I had to do in the first few weeks of class just to fix those things, the attitudes, the, the you know, win them over, be, be, show empathy. So we, we have to reduce the barriers. That's what UDL is. It's not, in a, in a way, it's not their fault they are like that, <laughs> right? But here they are. So what am I gonna do about it? So you're right, so, you know, I, when I did my teaching, you know, practicum, right? I, I, in Australia, I was in two schools. One school, it was a private school, for all boys school. Upper echelon of the society, very well mannered, these boys will come, they will, you know, they'll do this, Australians, eh? they'll do like this, they'll say, sir, can I help you with your books? Oh, can I open the door for you? Oh. Homework, guys? Yeah, everyone done. Oh, amazing. <laughs> it, it was 25 boys, usually boys never do work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one, 25 boys, guys, work, all done. <laughs> Six months later, I was in another school, <coughs> neighborhood school. Every day the police comes. <laughs> Every day. Right? Something. Robbery. Right? Uh, assault. Secondary school. <laughs> and these boys, right, they are so big. You know, some of these uh, islanders, they are like so big, you're like, you don't want to mess around with them, right? I get bullied. I get bullied. They arrest me. Yeah, they, they, when, when I walk past them, they'll do an Indian dance, you know? <laughs> they were arresting me. So again, I have to reframe and see, you know what, these kids, parents are not called, probably in the, in the jail somewhere, yeah. right? These kids come to school without lunch, uh, without breakfast. So the first three weeks, I was there for six weeks, yeah? First three weeks, I didn't even teach. <laughs> How to teach? <laughs> <laughs> but I spent time winning them over. A lot of engagements, right? Engagement, engagement. After three weeks, I gained their trust. Then, the last three weeks, the learning happened. Right? And now, I, they protect me. If another kid comes and says anything, they're like, oi. <laughs> right? They protect me. I have, I have bodyguards in the school, right? But. So you need to reframe, right? And, and see how, because the society will change in Indonesia, right? The, the middle class is increasing, the type of students you receive, paying students, they have a different mentality, right? They, yeah. they don't know the value of money. May I say something? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> society changes indeed. I experienced different cohort of students, totally different compared to 10 years ago. Things are so totally different. Uh, let's say 10 years ago, students tend to be obedient. They tend to be so, uh, except uh, SMBS case, I mean, it's a different case. Also in SSE, it was a different case. But at the beginning of Sampurna University, students tend to be more friendly. I mean, they would do just every homework the best they could. But later, changes until now, things are different. Uh, regarding multiple means of represent, representation, I mean, it is something quite similar to multiple uh, multimodalities. So I use different kinds of text because students nowadays they don't read. In my yeah, class, of course, they yeah. don't read. So I yeah. try to simplify, but then they can only read very simple text. Mm -hmm. They can only read very simple videos, and totally, I, I was not prepared for that. I mean. In, in my head, students would read, oh my goodness, so the challenge is so big and inclusive, okay, but uh, some of us, especially me, myself, I was not trained to handle those kind of Correct, yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, universal is good in concept, but in reality, it's so challenging. Look, I mean, you, you're, 
you're not going to be perfect. I mean, there's no way of, you know, uh, finding the right balance. But understanding that work is, is also changing, right? So, look, when I grew up, everything written. I write yeah. letters, yeah. I write, you apply for a job, you write <laughs> in pencil, I mean, in pen, you write a letter. Now, when was the last time I had a pencil and a paper? Yeah. Never, right? So, now with AI, generative text, I just need to provide the context and the idea. So the work has changed. People are getting fired, right? Because companies are saying, I don't need one person, yeah. 10 person to do this. One person can do this. So there's some value of, of, of the way things are changing outside. Like I was doing some training with some Korean kids here. Yeah? And these kids, we, when we talk about process, like, you know, product is, product is not as important as process. For them, it doesn't make sense. Because in Korea, the work culture is so competitive, you need to have a portfolio. So it doesn't make sense. So I am fighting their network if I say, no, 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 no. Process is more important than product. I need to find a way to find the balance for them to get them interested. You know what? We will get an awesome product out at the end. But in between, this is the process. So you, you have to change how you engage. Because they are being anxious of the work culture that is out there. So our students will also have those kind of uh, challenges, right? Back in those days, today you go at LinkedIn, a job application comes out, especially new companies, within two, 10 minutes, yeah, there'll be 3,600 applications. And then, when you see that, you don't even feel like I want to apply. I don't think I can compete with this, right? Yeah. So how do we help our students to overcome these anxieties, right? So maybe that's a way of for you to enter and say, look, if you have good public speaking skills, if you are very good at, look, even AI, if you do prompts, you need to do a proper prompt. Right? So teach them how to do effective prompts or maybe using proper language. It makes a difference. So, I mean, I know we are not here to talk about the nitty gritty of this, but I, I said, yeah, yeah, maybe in your faculties you need to have this discussion. Right? Because if not, it's going to be a chicken or egg thing. You want them to change first? <laughs> right? Or are we going to do something about it so that we can have more students, right? Students will go out and share, you know what, this is the this is the school you need to go to, right? Because they do things there very differently. Yesterday, I, uh, Kevin is not here, yeah? so I sat in his class. You know, the kids were very hip, a bit diva diva here and there. But I was very impressed with the way he handled the kids, right? He was talking about credit cards. He took out, he whipped out his own credit card, and then he was showing them, you know? And then the kids were engaged, he were asking questions. And one particular kid was trying to be a bit too diva, you know, <laughs> trying to be the center of attention, but he handled it really well. You know, he's like, he was very uh, polite, but shut him down at certain times. <laughs> we will talk about that later, you know, let's move on, you know. Kept raising his hands, it's like, oh good, you answered just now, let's give someone else a chance, you know. So he handled it really well. So you will have kids like this, right? So how do you manage them? It's a little bit different. But keep them engaged. You still need them because without people like that, the magnets, yeah. the other kids are not going to be engaged. Yeah, so you need to keep them happy. Yeah. Right? But these are smart kids, right? And they have lots of questions. But if it's out of the context of what we're talking about, you can say, yes, we, we can talk about this outside the class. Let's keep to what we are. So, so those are the three main networks, yeah? So, so let's go through this very quickly. So this is the first part, that's the first chunk. So the first chunk is about, the three parts are active choice. Active choice means the student needs to decide, I want to be here. I want to learn this, and this is fascinating. Right? And that's a challenge, right? <laughs> So we, you need to really thinking, rethink about engagement, right? You can rethink about engagement, right? 
Uh, and, and there are many ways to do this. You know, you can start off with a game, yeah. you know, sometimes, you know, it's get everyone's blood flowing. That's what you do when you do exercise, right? Yeah. When you go see your your pete, your personal trainer, what does he ask you to do? Get your blood, heart rate up, get your blood flowing, go run for five minutes, right? Same, do the same with the kids, five minutes, you know, jump up and down, do some exercise. Uh, I do all kinds of things. I do games, I, I do, I do sometimes, I, I do exercise, I do body combat, like for two minutes, you know, in the class, I do, uh, uh, I do breath work, you know, how to calm them down, you know, sometimes just teach them a breathing technique, whatever, just, just anything, you know, just, you don't have to start the class immediately, who said, where is it written, right? Yeah, do, do something else fun that you're good at, you know, then, after that, how do you keep them persistent? That's the next level of the checklist, right? Yeah. Meaning, week one, yeah, hey, hey, week two, <laughs> hey, but week six, how? One. Are they still, <laughs> you know? So you need to think about that. How do you keep them persistent? Because that's a challenge. And then the effort, the self-regulation, right? How do they sustain interest? Are you willing to modify the task? Can they suggest the task that they want to do? that is related to their interest. So you need to be flexible so that they can self-regulate, meaning I'm interested in this. Can I modify the task you gave? Can I change the rubric? Give them options. It doesn't have to be fixed. Nothing is fixed in learning, right? So make those, allow those changes and flexibility, as, but not in all subject areas, yeah, because you, you can't say if you're studying you know, electronics, then you want to do architecture. Yeah, sorry, it's two different fields. You're in the wrong class. But if, if, yeah, if, if the task can be varied, why not? Right? Find out what's their interest. So let me give you an example. Communication, let's say I'm teaching a communication class, right? Managing conflicts. Let's say I start with this. Have you seen this before? This is called the uh, Ofsted's cultural dimensions. So someone did a research between different cultures in terms of power distance, uncertainty avoidance, just different aspects of communication. So culture actually affects how we manage conflicts, right? Yeah. How we attend. Uh, so let me just show you an example, right? Look at this. You can actually go to the website and pick the countries and you get this map. Look at French people, confrontational, right up there. So when you're dealing with a French person, be careful, all right? They will speak their mind and tell you off. Agreed. Okay. Right? Agreed? Okay. Right. Now, talk about, uh, let's, let's look at another one, yeah? Linear time, look at India. That means when they say 8 o'clock, it's ain't 8 o'clock, <laughs> right? I'm sure Indonesia is somewhere around here, so. <laughs> right? Nobody shows up on time. So, so understanding this helps you to manage and work in different cultures, yeah. right? So this is a very useful tool. So where does Indonesia is in all these things? So you cannot take your American curriculum and expect students, so you need to make adjustments. I'm not saying linear time in Indonesia is here, it's a good thing, but obviously you want it to be here, but it doesn't happen overnight. Look at power distance, right? US can work in very low contacts. That's why they are very entrepreneurship, you know, things move fast because they need very low contacts. Startups, Silicon Valley, that's why America is the way it is. Now look at Japan, so high contacts. Before they get something moving, everything has to be perfect. Yeah, so it's, you, you gotta understand where, where it is. So let's look at an example of Korea, right? Look at Korea. KR, do you see that, the yellow part? And so if I'm teaching a communication class, I will share this about Korean 
There was an incident of a Korean air flying to Guam. Right? The plane crashed before the runway. And unfortunately, 229 people lost their lives. You know the reason once the National Transportation Safety, NTSB or something, right? Safety board, right? They found out it was power distance. <laughs> there was a pilot. The Usually in a plane, there's the, the pilot flying, pilot monitoring. So the pilot was the pilot flying. The, the, the co-pilot was the pilot monitoring. And they had an engineer in the cockpit. It was a 747, right? The pilot was making errors. The co-pilot and the engineer knew things were wrong. But in Korean culture, you don't speak to the authorities, right? They were suggesting, but they never explicitly warned him and said, so even six seconds before the plane crashed, the co-pilot was suggesting we do a re, instead of, what's the purpose of the pilot monitoring? Is to observe the pilot flying, right? And you know in planes, when the captain mentioned, the, the, the tower mentions 23,000 feet, you need, you don't change, you need to say, 23,000 feet confirmed, and then the co-pilot is to repeat 23,000 feet confirmed, and then the pilot will 30 to 23,000 feet, and then say, altitude change 23,000 feet, and then confirm. Why? Because safety is so important. I mean, that's such a big piece of metal flying in the air, right? That's what they found out. Six seconds, they, they were still suggesting, let's take a turn around. Instead of saying, scolding <laughs> and saying, what the heck are you doing? Make a turn around right now. So the suggestion was to reduce the power distance. So that means the pilot flying, pilot monitoring, what was already in the rule book was not working because of culture. Because of that, 239 people lost their lives. So if I'm teaching um, a management communication, I will say, do you think communication is important? <laughs> yeah, it is. Right? It's very important. And what would I say? I would say, look, have you been in a position where you've been afraid to speak up? What happened? Now, why am I sharing this? This is the story part, right, of my class. It's the hope to engage the student. Right? Let's say recent election. I can bring that into context, right? Why is it important to speak up? Why is activism important? Why is ethic and opinion important? Because if we don't do this, democracy can be ruled, right? People can take advantage. So again, these are the ways you engage. That's the first, right? Now, is that my syllabus, Korean Air? No. Will it be in my textbook? No, I have to do a bit of research. Right, dig up some things, see the relevance, put it in my deck, get familiarized with what happened, and then share it. Why? Because I think that can be the story to engage the kids. Right, why is public speaking important? Right, managing conflicts. What's the tendency of most Asians when it comes to managing conflict? Avoidance. Right? Avoidance. So we need to change that. Sometimes we need to speak up in a respectful way. But how do you do that? Why is it important? You see that you can teach a communications class, but if you cannot buy in at the buy-in, why is it important to do? They will never speak up. But they will get an A for your class. <laughs> but they will go into the workforce and never speak up in their entire lives. That's not what we want. Right? So you want. So this is the motivation of the engagement part. This is very important. So what's the next part? That's this is what we call the information processing system, right? 
So we'll stop, we'll have a short break after this. So when, when there is a data, right? Short term memory. So how much can the short term memory hold? Do you know? There's a lot of research on this. Anyone knows? Design? You should know this. Because when people see ads or people see there's a certain number of information they can hold. So we use that to make sure that that's the number of information we put on posters. Right? We chunk it. Five to seven. Maximum seven. Seven chunks of data or information we can hold. That's very high performer, yeah? Most of us, it's like if I give you seven numbers, I flash it and I flash it off, most likely you can repeat five. Yeah. Three. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some will recall all seven, some will be five, some will be like two. Yeah. Now, does that mean you're less intelligent? No. No. It's, it's genetics. Can you train it to be a bit better? Yes. But, so that's very important. So when you present data, make sure it's in small chunks. Yeah. Right? Don't do a text dump. I, I was in a class when there were what, 50, <laughs> 20 plus slides filled with text, one after the other for two hours. <laughs> I can bet you nothing went there. Yeah. Because I lost interest after five minutes. <laughs> right? It was not interesting. I did not enjoy the class. I can only imagine how the students felt. I feel for them. So break it down. Make it in chunks. Right? Now what happens? Then after that, now, if you overload what happened, memory loss. Right, you're talking, it's all going up, nothing is retained. I can't even hope, right? Next, it goes to the working memory, right? This is where you are making connections. So, it is very important to recall what you've done last week, the week before, or how does it relate to the concept we talked about two weeks ago, or maybe in a previous lesson. Remember when we do our, our NACHI thing, we talk about reinforcement, what, it comes from here, right? You have to make connections to things that have been previously taught and see how it ties in, right? The big picture, right? Because usually when you take one class, is that enough for you to be an engineer? If you take one, mass, one communication class, are you ready to be a public speaker? <laughs> No. That means knowledge is encompassing, right? So you need to connect the dots. Rehearsal is good, like when I say a quick quiz, what's the three networks? You panic a bit, and then you recall, you rehearse. What I'm doing is, I'm working your working memory. But the best part to make people remember is recall, right? And connect with previous knowledge. Ah, I see. For example, in information systems, right, when you make the connection between matrices, how we solve neural networks using matrix multiplication, right? So in school, we learn matrices. What is it for? Don't ask. <laughs> That's how we learn matrices, right? Then you go to college and you learn, oh, we can solve equations. Ah, uh, gradient descent. Oh, makes sense. Now we make the connection. Right? So then students go, oh, this is interesting. I never knew. Right? So that's the working memory. Still, some things get lost. Right? Now, how do you keep them focused? Don't do what I'm doing. Lecture for more than 20 minutes. Yeah. Right? 20 minutes, stop. Yeah. Take a break, five minutes. Because the brain cannot take. If you take a short break, the brain can process a little bit. When you sleep, the brain processes, releases the toxins, reinforces the memory. So focus is very important. So 
One thing I notice is usually the kids in the front are focused and the back are not focused. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? So you, we already know that. So what are you going to do to get them focused? You got to go to the back, uh, rearrange the chest like this. This takes five minutes, right? Just say, hey guys, form groups. Right? And then get them engaged. Get the kids at the back to join some of the kids. If they let them be, they will be not focused. Right? Next, finally, rehearsal, we've done that. Relation is what makes it stick in the long-term memory. Right? The story, right? The connection, I can relate to that. Then the skill, I see how I can apply it. Then it sticks. Then when you say, can you remember the three networks? Yes! I can remember the three networks because the story is there, right? So we know the information processing system works like this. So next, right? So you, you store, it is stored because it's important and it can be retrieved as and when it's needed. So that's how the information processing network works. So how do we teach? To make sure this network is maximized, right? I'll give you two options. I have two videos. Which one do you want to watch? One is what atoms are really look like, and the other one is about the neuroscience of value. Both. Atoms. You want to see both? <laughs> okay, all right. But before that, let's take a quick five minute break. Yeah? Let's take a break, grab a drink, come back, and we'll finish up. Alright? Okay, so you want to see both videos? Yeah. Okay. So one is, uh, I think, more business related uh, branding. Okay. This one is uh, more party ones. <laughs> Do you ever struggle explaining how the Atomic model looks like. Right? This part, you want to twirl. Uh, <laughs> actually, this is basic. So this is a. Have you seen this? Yes. 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 I just realized the presentation, the atomic materials, and then you had fixed orbit, right? You want to get this? You want some? It's a. Yeah. So so this one. They use mathematics. Yeah, but you don't need to know, but it actually shows you the clock. Yes, and the circular as well, the yeah, motion. Yeah. Okay, ready for some uh, short movie time? Yes. Okay, so the first one is about the. Uh, Okay, so if you are in uh, chemistry, teaching sciences, this is a big thing, right? Because when I was in school, they say the topic theory is, yeah, the nucleus in the middle, and then it's like a pie, and then they say, no, 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 actually, they have their own orbits in, in high school. And then when you go to a, a secondary school, uh, in, in A level, they tell you something else. I remember going up to my chemistry teacher and say, is this the truth? I said, I feel like I'm being lied to. You're not telling me how the atomic, how atoms actually look like. Every school year, you tell me a different story. So what is the truth? Will they teach me something else when I go to uni? They said, yes. So you're still lying to me. <laughs> so this is a very good way uh, to show how atoms actually look like. Right? Because, like, like, like as you know, the electrons don't are not in one physical. You cannot determine the position, right? There's a probability cloud where it can be. So, how do you show this to students, right? So this is a great example if you have never seen it. So let's watch this.
Thanks to Google for sponsoring a portion of this video, for supporting small businesses, and for helping people find jobs. More about all that at the end. Atomic orbitals have long been a source of frustration for me. On the one hand, you have simple cartoon diagrams that make them feel friendly, but which are so buried and vague they don't really convey much beyond the basic idea that atoms have a nucleus and some electrons. Some people try to take the cartoony diagrams and make them feel more random or quantum, which is an improvement, but they're still very much just cartoon stand-ins for the vague idea of atom. On the other hand, you have atomic orbitals depicted as fuzzy clouds or balloons or rainbow donuts, which are definitely more technically accurate or technically inspired, but none of which feel like they give me a sense of what's actually going on. Like, what does this blobby thing have to do with orbiting electrons? Is the electron inside it or on the surface? Why do some of them have blobs and others donuts? And why are some of the donuts rainbow colored? I want to know what an atom looks like, and I want that picture to actually have something to do with the nitty gritty reality of atoms, since they are indeed real things. You know, like how a diagram of the solar system is sort of a totally not to scale caricature, and yet also represents the very real idea that the planets all over the sun are in the same plane, and that some are farther out and some are closer in, and if it's animated, we get to see that the closer planets complete their orbits more often. It's a nice picture, and that's what I want for atoms, a good picture. There are a few things I'd like that picture to get across, some of them because they're important to the physics of atoms, and some of them because they're questions my brain wants answers to. Like, where is the electron? How fast is it going? How much energy does it have? How big is this picture relative to other pictures? Of course, the wave particle nature of quantum mechanics means some of these ideas, like the electron's position, don't translate exactly from our everyday intuition to the atomic scale. But there is a way of thinking about wave-particle duality where you picture the wave function as a bunch of water and the particle as a speck of dust in that water. The particle is mostly guided by where the water goes, and the water is guided by the equations that determine how water behaves depending on its circumstances. And if you apply the mathematics of that idea to atomic orbitals and then render it in three dimensions, here's what you get. Isn't it beautiful? Here's another. structure and detail in them, I just love it. You can see patterns in the orbitals, and you can get a sense that they actually are orbitals. I mean, something is orbiting. Okay, so I do have to be clear. The dots don't each represent a separate electron. The whole collection represents the wave function of a single electron, and the individual dots represent all the places that electron could be. A higher density of dots means a higher probability of the electron being there. The bigger orbitals are the ones with higher energies, because electrons with more energy are more likely to be far away from the nucleus. The motion of the dots is showing the flow of the wave function, and does correspond to an extent with its actual angular momentum, though they're not electron trajectories. Unless you think Fomian trajectories are real, in which case, they really are electron trajectories. I'll let the philosophers of physics fight that one out. But the point is, these visuals are created by representing actual electron wave functions in a visual language that our brains can understand that of objects and light and shadows and motion in 3D space. There's actually stuff orbiting, and they're pretty. I hope you like them as much as I do. Oh, one final thing. I 100% get these are not easy to draw. So if you want a cartoon representation of an atom that's simple but more closely based in atomic physics, here's my proposal. It's based on the orbitals from the p-block of the periodic table. One of them has the electron orbiting one way, one in the opposite way, and in the third one, the electron is orbiting the same amount, but around some perpendicular direction, and we can't know which. Which is why the dots aren't moving in the middle orbital, and why I've drawn a dotted line and question mark for the sideways circle. And if you want, you can add an electron to each orbital, or two electrons, one oriented spin up and one spin down. This is a minute physics approved cartoon representation. Okay. Why I showed you that is... Good. Okay, good question. <laughs> I know it doesn't make sense to everyone, yeah. but imagine you're in a science class and you're teaching this, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Can you explain this? No. There are resources out there that are so good, done so well, there's no way you can produce them. I will just shut up and just play this and take off 15 slides off my deck. 
So that's on the second representation model. Always look whether there are very high quality resources out there. If they are there and they do a better way of explaining it, just show it to the students. And you can summarize the key points because in every university, there's learning outcomes and there's very specific things you will test. And you need to tell them, I need you to know this. But to understand the whole concept, just watch this. Right? So if you're teaching about, you're studying chemistry and, and you're teaching about the probability theory of where the electron is, it's not in a fixed position, this is a very good thing. Students, they will understand. Ah, okay. It makes sense. I understand how atomic structures look like, right? So that's it. Amano, yes. I use a lot of videos because I want to show them something simple. But then after that, I practice. I teach writing, academic writing. So principles of academic writing, I show, I show them videos, simple and very easy to understand. But I told them please read more. I mean, I gave them references to get in-depth understanding, but they don't. Yeah, they won't. Yeah. Of course, they won't. <laughs> would you? I would. I would. Okay. Yeah. We're okay, all, okay. We're all for we're Okay, okay. But you, you're a different. You, you yeah. know, you you. Yeah. 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 Most most people, when you give reference, unless it is related to some way to assessment yeah. or something that they need to know, they will not. So you need to break down the task, right? Let's say you show them something. This is this. This is a skill you need to know. You give them just one reference <coughs> or two. Tell them to pick which one suits them and say there is something you need to learn there that will be tested. You have to make it and break it down so precise. Don't give them, you see, you and me, you give me five reference, I will check all of them. I'm a bit kiasu, yeah? yeah? I want to make sure I get my A star, so I will check. This case, you give them five great resources, they will not bother to look at it because it doesn't affect their grades. So why should I look at them? So give them a reason to look at it. And resources, there are many. Pick the best. Be very, be very, uh, very choosy. Unless they can do a damn good job, don't use it. Right? If you, when I look at a resource, if it doesn't hook me, I won't show it to the students. Then I need to find a way to do it myself. But the chances are today, there are so many things out there. There are people that do an amazing job explaining things. Just last week, I watched Veritasium. They talked about, uh, again, this is a bit science here, I'm sorry, uh, about the blue diode, how the challenge in the in the, in the industrial field to create blue light. I didn't know the story about that. Uh, there was, it was a great video that showed and explained the science behind it. I was so mesmerized, right? So if somebody does a good job like that, just show that, right? And take off 15 slides from your, from your class, right? This, and then give them one reference that they need to look at because they need to have the skill to search and tell them this is a, something you need to know from that reference, all right? And it will be tested. Then they will do it. But don't give them five because they won't bother looking at it. Okay, so this one is more language and neuroscience, so you may enjoy this. Oh, is it? It's just a tunnel, just as you imagine.
7. Tylenol, just acetaminophen, and Levi's are just jeans. Yet consumers go out of their way to select these specific brands over others. And economists would say, how is this possible? that a rational consumer would be willing to pay more for exactly the same thing. We love to think about ourselves as rational. That's not how it works. A very famous study done by colleagues at Duke University it flashed either the Apple logo or the IBM logo to two randomized groups of participants. The study found that after being subliminally exposed to the Apple logo, Compared to when you've been exposed to the IBM logo, participants performed better on creative tasks. And the argument is that Apple has been telling you this story over and over again, that Apple is the brand for hip, cool, fun, creative people. This is the true power of brands. They can influence our behavior in ways that extend way beyond the point of sale. So, to what degree can the influence of brands wreak havoc on our ability to make rational spending decisions? This is your brain on money. This is Marcus Reed. He studies identity and marketing at the University of Pennsylvania. When I make choices about different brands, I'm choosing to create an identity. When I put that shirt on, when I put those shoes on, those jeans, that hat, someone is going to form an impression about what I'm about. So if I'm choosing Nike over Under Armour, I'm choosing a kind of different way to express affiliation with sport. The Nike thing is about performance. The Under Armour thing is about the underdog. I have to choose which of these different conceptual pathways is most consistent with where I am in my life. And once a consumer makes that choice, their relationship with the brand can deepen to the point where they identify with the brand like family. And once you identify with a brand, it can shape the way you behave. And it's really interesting because they will also, if someone talks bad about that product, brand, or service, they will be the first to go out and defend. Why? Because an attack on the brand is an attack on themselves. <laughs> Michael Platt is a professor of neuroscience, marketing, and psychology whose research demonstrates how our perception of brands influences our decisions. There's an idea in marketing, which is that we relate to brands in the same way we relate to people. Like, I love this brand, or I hate this brand. Of course, what people say right, can often be different from what's really going on in their heads. So we thought, well, why don't we just ask the brain directly? Michael and his team observed the brains of iPhone users and Samsung Galaxy users with an MRI machine while they heard good, bad, and neutral news about Apple and Samsung. Apple customers showed a brain empathy response toward Apple that was exactly what you'd see in the way you would respond to somebody in your own family. Strangely, Samsung users didn't have any positive or negative responses when good or bad news was released about their brand. The only evidence that Samsung users showed was reverse empathy for Apple news, meaning if the Apple headline was negative, their brain reflected a positive response. You know, it really shows us that Apple has completely defined the market here. Samsung customers, it seems, from their brain data, are only buying Samsung because they hate Apple. The, gamer, the Samsung users didn't report feeling the result their MRIs showed. What was happening in their brains and what they reported feeling towards Apple and Samsung were totally different. Most people just don't realize that they are subconsciously choosing brands because those brands have some kind of self-expressive value in You can see there's a lot of power here in terms of shaping uh, consumers' decisions. As we learn more and more about that, we have to think much more deeply about the ethical, legal, and societal implications of doing nothing. So as consumers, what can we do to make informed choices? Well, the best thing we can do is be aware of the influence that brands hold. I think it's important to always pause and think a little bit about, okay, why am I buying this product? And like it or not, brands aren't going anywhere. I've heard lots of people push back and say that I'm not into brands. I take a very different view. They're not doing anything any different than what someone who affiliates with a brand is doing. They have a brand. It's just an anti-brand brand. When I think about what is it that I've learned about identity over time. I think a lot of it 
it has to do with the fundamental need that we as humans have to have support systems. Perhaps it was the church, it was the community, it was these other institutions that existed. Now brands have stepped in as pillars of our identity. So I'm very much motivated to see that in that positive light. Absolutely. 
jigsaw activity. You tell me what is avoidance. Right? Get the kids engaged. So I don't have to show I don't have to show 30 slides of this, you know, and go through the text one by one. And then what I can do is, let's say if I'm the expert, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a counselor, I'm a coach, I have real life experience dealing with people, so I can chime in on this. That's the added value, not the textbook. Yeah. Textbook is only theory. Yeah. What I bring to the table as an instructor in this yeah. college is real life experience. Mm -hmm. People that I've met. People who look so together on the outside, but on the inside they're a mess. <laughs> right? I can share this this things in more depth. Okay? Passive aggression. Did you know that passive aggression is a way people resort to when they don't want to face conflict? happens very often. A lot of people don't realize that. So again, so this is representation. I showed you video, I'm showing you this. There's no text. No need text, right? I can make things stick. So last part is the options, yeah? How do I interact with the information? Discussion, opinions, uh, counter arguments. You know, when you deal with kids, when you talk about branding, you show them this and say, what's your response? They will have a different opinion, right? When I challenge my daughter, she said, Dad, not everything about TikTok is bad, right? <laughs> you know how many things I learned from TikTok? And then she will tell me, oh, I learned this, I learned It's good, right? If she has the skill, because she's a pharmacy student, so she's very scientific, right? So she can illuminate, this is rubbish, this is nonsense, this is great. She has the skill. Some students may not have the skill. So they need to learn the skill. But once you learn, TikTok becomes a useful tool. Maybe you can use it as a teaching tool. Maybe they submit the assignments using TikTok. Right? How do you how do you do persuasion in TikTok in 15 seconds? Why is it important? Because when you do pitching, yeah, when you pitch an idea uh, to a venture capitalist. You have 30 seconds to pitch your idea. So maybe that's a good training. TikTok is a useful tool, right? So again, just find ways how you can interact with the information. They can express what they know. How do they express? Give them options. And how can they reflect and plan on those options? Reflection is important, right? How, what did they learn? What did they leave wrong? What can they do better next time? All right, you fail the test, why? What would you do better? I think that's very important after you do some assessments. Ask them, go through this, right? Reflection is where you build executive function, right? How do you plan your learning? When you are having problems, what do you do? Right? When I don't understand something, what do I do? How do I reach out to my instructor? How can I contact? How can I express what I don't understand? These are all executive functions. Okay? That comes from self-regulation. So, plan so that you train them in these things. 
Okay? It's not always about learning, it's a lot about reflecting on your learning as well. Okay? So what are the key features of UDL? There's a strong focus on goals. What I mean by that is there's a lot of noise. Identify the signals. You know, when you get a textbook that you use for your course, yeah, it's this thing. And then the learning outcomes. So how do you from all this noise? There's a lot of noise in these textbooks, yeah? A lot of irrelevant things, right? <coughs> And then sometimes you get decks from, let's say, from partner that's not very good. So what do you do? So how do, I, how do you identify the signal? This is the most important thing you must know. It's your job as an instructor. And eliminate all that noise that is not needed. So you guide the students through a journey so that they can uh, focus on the goals. There's a lot of sub goals sometimes, but they are not as important. What is the key goals? Three things. What did I say were the three things we're going to do today? What are the objectives? What's the first one? Motivation. The three goals. Remember, I said the objective. The first one was. Do you remember? Deeper understanding of the UDL. So now, do you have a deeper understanding before you came? Yeah. Yes, you do now, right? It's based on neuroscience based on network. So the second one was the principle. key principles of UDL, which is now. There's a strong focus on goals. There's a focus on variability. Different representations, right? Different options, right? There's a lot of variety. It's not fixed. If, you, if I go to any class and everything is fixed, rigid, then you're not doing UDL. Right? You are doing maybe what we call the traditional way of teaching, which is I lecture, you listen, take the test, go home, then leave my class, finish. Right? No. There's a focus on the barriers in the design of the environment. That means you look at students not as problematic, you look at what you can do to reduce the barrier. Students are not focused, reality. Students don't read as much, yeah. reality. Students are a bit spoiled, reality. Yeah. Students come late, that's a bad reality. Right? They don't show up on time. Yeah. So these are all realities. Instead of saying, these colors will never change, you need to reframe and say, what can I do to reduce the barriers in my design so that I can get rid of all these things. Right? Like I said, the innovation class that I went there today, if she has another class tomorrow, I will go. <laughs> because I enjoy it. I will want to try. But if you do a text dump, there's a chances next week I'm not showing up. And it happens worldwide, yeah, not here. My my daughter called me last week. She said, Dad, I got this useless lecture. <laughs> he is so bad. He said, I skipped my class today. I don't want to go. I, I will be more productive sitting at home. I'm just reading his slides. Doesn't make sense. You see, and lecturers are so oblivious, they don't even realize. But of course, she has very praise for not the instructor. That, and this is a top uni in the UK. It happens worldwide. Right? They are, they are instructors that are oblivious. They are in a different world. They come here and they say, I'm the expert, my way or the I way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yes. yes, they don't care. Yeah. They don't care. And they don't realize these students actually want to learn. Yeah. They want to be a good pharmacist. They want to, you know, especially when contents are difficult, yeah? Especially part in your courses. Your contents are challenging, it's not easy. No, they want to learn, they want to be good engineers. So how do you reduce the barriers? Right? How do we create a branding for this university, right? Again, over time, uh, the marketing can do whatever they want to do. It's the graduates who leave this school who will create the branding for this university, right? No amount of posters, money you spend, will have any effect unless the students who leave here and say, you've got to go to SU. 
the way they teach that is just different. You never find this kind of teaching there. But if you allow your lecturers, yeah, especially if they head of department, do text dumps like this, <laughs> you're not going to get those things, right? So address those barriers. What can you do? Now, you're not going to be able to fix everything. No. But the more you can engage, the better, right? If you're doing 40 and you can increase to 70, that's a great achievement, right? Sometimes the 30 at this whole class, you cannot do anything. All right? Quiz. Oh. Oh. What are the three key main features of UBI? of learning is very important. How do they demonstrate? Some classes I notice at the end of the lecture, the lecturer will say, questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. Bye. My question is, how do you know that whatever you taught on that day, they already acquired the skill? How do you know? That, that, that's what I do. How did you must leave with some evidence? Right? Remember, if you go banking or you go buy anything, you want evidence, right? Give me the receipt. Would you say, no need receipt, I know. So then how to return? You want evidence, right? You take picture, la, go check, they deliver, they take picture, send to you, pa, la, confirm, la, la, send, yeah? evidence. How can a lecturer walk up without knowing did my students learn or not? You must have some kind of an assessment. Yeah. It can be verbal, it can be group work, it can be a submission of something to confirm that they understand. Especially when you teach difficult subjects, the chances are 50% won't get it in first class. But I need the evidence so that when I come back next week, I can reinforce some of these things. Right? I was in Pak Muriel's class, which was, he's not here today, but he did a fantastic job. He was teaching statistics. Uh, he, uh, he, he taught them the theory, and then after that, he gave them a sample data, he broke them into groups, and he said, now, solve it. And then he told them, come up and share your results. Write it down. And then he showed them the mistakes, or they, he encouraged them where they did well, and then he went back to the slide said, this one I'm going to test you eh, on Friday. Yeah. So you've done it already. Great job. Yeah. So when the students left, everybody left very happy because they know Friday the test they will all pass. Mm. Because all the skills that will be tested, they did it. Which I thought was great. If you give them assignment to go home and do, they cannot do, who do they ask? <laughs> if they ask a friend, friend also don't know then how. If no internet at home, how? Might as well read at home, do the work in the class so that I can mentor or the other students can mentor you. Right? So, this, like, what, why I'm sharing this is because I saw a lot of great examples this week when I went in. Uh, I was in the DCD class. Uh, they did some theory, then after that, everyone was given a piece of paper and said, okay, now do your work and slide. Yeah, so which was great, which I thought, if I cannot do, so I turned to, <laughs> but normally I said, hey, how do you do this? Like, you know how to do it. He said, yeah, 20 years ago, I did this, right? 
But that's the way process needs to be, right? Learn, do. Show me you can do. Then you be show me. Show me. You need to have some sort of evidence that you have. Yeah. Show me the money. <laughs> Don't tell me you understand. How do I know? Demonstrate. Right? I, I can dance. Show me. Show me the moon. Right? You need to have some. I understand you don't have the time, but you need to put 15 minutes aside at the end to get students to demonstrate what they learned for the day. Maths, make sure they can solve the equation, okay? Let me give you an equation to do this your work. How many of you can do? Create psychological safety, meaning they can admit openly I cannot do this. Okay, 50% of you cannot do this question, okay? I, it's not a criticism to your teaching, right? It's just information. Data is nothing but information. Emotions are just data, right? So take the information, come back with another strategy to help the other 50% of Simple as that, right? When you create this kind of a culture, that students will feel safe. A lot of students I don't think they don't ask questions in some classes, but in classes where they feel safe, they ask a lot of questions, right? Some Lecturers, they just don't bother asking questions. I wonder why. Right? I wonder why. But some classes, they are like, the lecturer says, can you put your hands up? <laughs> 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 you continue. Like that, right? So you get this. I see this different. So those are the. Okay, another question. Give me one example of self regulation. Remember the first network? Self regulation. Can you give me one example of what self-regulation is? It's how they, they have their own strategy to learn. Yeah. So they manage the way they learn something. Correct, yeah. What else? Who called their class schedule on a calendar? Yeah. Some students don't do that. <coughs> we know what class today, right? Why? Not on their calendar. Simple thing, right? Homework submission. Canvas not safe to their phone, so they don't see the deadline. Simple thing, these are self regulation. Self regulation. Quiz last week, five questions, I got two wrong. When I see Papa I need to talk to him. I have some questions. So that's self regulation. Ask Papa ask my friend. So that's self regulation, yeah? We want to build those skills so they take responsibilities for their own learning. You cannot expect them to have it. No students, I I, I don't think many students in Indonesia have self-regulation. No. Yes, school uh, yeah. parents. Yeah. Self yeah, helicopter parents, yeah. yeah. So yeah. they don't have the skill. You need to train them. Next, last one. One example of executive function. The last network, executive function. What is an executive function? You actually know this. It's, it's very basic skills. Like, like uh, how would you plan for success? Be successful with small things. Small things. Break down the task into small chunks. Uh, manage your schedule. What are the most important assignments you need to do this week? When is the delivery date for this assignment? How do you manage it so you can finish it on time? Group study, organize group studies so that we can learn together. So these are executive functions. Students on their own can work out things so that they can be successful. They can also figure out when you give them option, okay, you can you can present, you can do a video, or you can do this. They can decide which one they want to do. They can pick an option and then they can work around it so that it meets their path. So these are all executive functions. Right? Sometimes I you can even ask what how do you think you can demonstrate your skills in this area? Let them come up with ideas. Write down three and then get everybody to think. That's another way to do it as well. Right? So these are executive functions. I 
think now you know what is QDL, yeah? <laughs> yes. Right? Well, uh, a short table task while we are eating. I think we're supposed to finish at 11.30, right? Okay. So maybe let's spend about 20 minutes on this, not too long. While we are eating, go grab a drink. And then we can just have a short discussion among the groups, and then we can break up. Okay? So this is my challenge. So remember the third objective, I want you to practice. Okay? Uh, on designing a very short lesson, but using UDL. Okay? And I'm going to give you a common topic, because all of us are from different faculties. Okay? And I'm going to be a little bit biased on this. This is your task. <laughs> yeah. It's it's a two week lesson, two weeks, four lessons. You meet twice a week, so there are four lessons, and you are going to teach about the traditional way. Tradition. You can pick any way. All right. I want you to design in such a way that you can engage, sustain their interest for two weeks, and then get the family Okay? This is describing traditional. Okay. Describing.
eating traditional There's a lot of story behind that. Okay. Second, uh, to elicit various responses and to engage. Oh. Yeah, to, engage is, to elicit, elicit their, their knowledge story. about that kind of way. <laughs> so are there different types? Many, yeah. very yeah. types. So many. Yeah. But mostly like, most... Did I say something? Yeah. 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 Like they close their eyes and they try. Like, can you have you ever eaten it? Like, you know, taste test. Taste. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> taste test would be good because then it will hit all. <laughs> I cannot write. <laughs> no, I mean there's into it. That's why taste test. Yeah. Oh my God. I, it's confusing. I, my English <laughs> for my <laughs> dyslexia. <laughs> um, I cannot write on this. Like, I would have made lots of mistakes, so I cannot see. I want to make the this uh, test challenging and more excited instead of only blind okay, test this one and then uh, blind test test blind test 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 I, got I, wouldn't, types of I wouldn't be able to distinguish chocolate. They're just chocolate. No, there's dark, there's white, there's yeah. milk, but then also, like, you know, it doesn't have anything. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Are you speak out text? Speak out text is everything, and then oh. these are the steps. Speak out text is the type of text that we want them to go to. And then they are followed up with question like, have you ever faced the result of the case test? To elicit their experience. They need like competition in like class, if you like rushing to the meal or the game. It's printing because it's a blindfold. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
there's all And then there should be also like a lesson when it comes to just to maybe yeah. get them in person to their Yes. Yes. So after this, so this is the beginning. This is to get the main page, is it? The main The main lesson is. We get them in groups. Yeah. So one discuss the history, one discuss the the ingredients, perhaps. One discuss the yeah. One discuss when the, the cake is uh, usually served. The, the culture. Yeah. Maybe variety. So this is a. This is a. So this is what the whole thing is about. These are the steps. So the second step is really group discussion. So how many groups? Four? Let's say four. So it depends on the number yeah. of students. So group one, yeah. I mean, let's say here, let's say group one is about uh, the history, the origin, the origin, and the history. Number two, the ingredients. <laughs> and how to put that? Yeah. yeah. And then uh, the part C, right? Yeah. And, uh, part C is uh, when it is served. Uh, yeah. When and how? But I don't know the
present. One of my speeches, actually, they have to make reels for one minute. I, I told them to tag me in my Instagram, but only two of them. But I don't know what. Still, they did. Done? Yes. Okay. Okay. You guys done already? Yes. Okay. All right. So to finish up, let's let's get the groups to briefly share what you've done. So I think it'll be good to hear. Shall we start with Pa Parin here? Yeah. They have something very interesting here. Maybe just walk in here, bring your stuff. Bring it here. Okay, everyone. Um, this is <laughs> don't cut, don't judge the book by its cover, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we are thinking about making the other group great again. <laughs> <laughs> this is the class title, great, great again. So, <laughs> the, the subtitle. <laughs> The, the subtitle is how to make the Dargulu. That's the learning outcomes of this class. Okay? So because we start we, we, we started about UDL, so how we start this one define the class by defining the why, the what, and the how. Okay? The why, we first agreed that we should explain to the students the why they need to attend this class. And we explain here the data of market share in the e-commerce about Kuwait, 10 billion months, 10 billion uh, rupiah per month. Yeah. Yes, yes, and meaning that they, a day, a day, they, they are three hundred million per day. Yes. Suppose you are just taking that one percent, meaning that you can get a revenue of one uh, three million per day. Do you want to become one of these? Dadar kuli partnership. Dadar kuli partnership. So one mil, one mil, uh, three million per day is in front of you. So that's that's the why. And then we go to the what. What is uh, uh, show and taste the dargulung. This is the fun part, of course, the, uh, in the class. Uh, we, we will do show and taste the dargulung in the class. And then we go to the how. The, the first how. meeting, we will ask the student to taste uh, various types of dargulung. Various uh, pasta traditional yeah. that we call uh, grains. So we will bring them. Okay, this is the taste of the pure dargulung that's available in the market. I want to be like that. <laughs> Introduction to the ultimate Tadal Guru. <laughs> <laughs> we, will, we will show them how the, the secret recipe, the success story, the online online shop study case, yeah. in which they can get uh, uh, some revenue of the, from the Tadal Guru, from making business quick. Yeah. Okay. Then the second meeting is we do field trip. Field trip. Field trip where, Pak? We have a lot of pasar tradisional. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We have a lot of traditional uh, pasar tradisional that is famous in Jakarta. That we will bring them around to see how does it like uh, uh, sells uh, in, in a real life. Kue partnership, yeah, Pak. Yeah. To see how the kue partnership is going on. And also UMKM. UMKM also, also going to UMKM. And then talk with the yeah the online shop uh, uh, practitioners. Okay. And then the, meet, the, the the third meeting, the third week, the third meeting is we cook together, cook the dargulung together, like the recipe, how to change color, how to modify the taste, etc. Make your own dargulung. In this case, we will invite expert as well. Yeah, yeah. come to the class and cook with us and give give feedback. Give feedback. <laughs> Okay. And finally, this is the fun part. This is the fun part. We will make an exhibition of the Dargulu. Make great the Dargulu Yeah. Okay. Reflection. Reflection. the reflection is very important. And that's it. That's it. The four ways of the shape. Making the Dargulu great again. Thank you, part one. Yeah, I feel like I want to join this class. Can, maybe we can add this in G. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Next group. No, I just hold out the paper. Wow. Complete. 
lesson plan in seven minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. They already put the bar very high. <laughs> I want to lower it. <laughs> what an excuse. Well, it's not about entrepreneurship, but it's about uh, sharing experience. Actually, the concern is uh, personally, is, it's not on behalf of the others. Uh, teen teenagers nowadays are not really aware of traditional cakes. They are more aware about kitako and uh, those pizza, etc., etc. So it's about more cultural, cultural awareness. So if we have to take it into language, then it would be something like recount. But actually, it is also about some procedural or something. So anyway, uh, so that's that's the the why. So we want them to have more awareness. We want them to know that we we have our own Indonesian cakes such as kalapon, et etc. Et so what we what we <laughs> plan to do is the first time we're going to uh, have this taste test blindfolded. So we're going to <laughs> prepare uh, several kinds of cake. And then we will ask kue. Okay, kue. We're going to use the word kue. And then we're going to ask them to taste that while they are blindfolded. After that, we're going to create a game so they will uh, match what they have tasted with the with the real case, whether they got it correctly or not. And um, so this is also for the uh, how to get the uh, the students engaged, uh, to elicit their knowledge, to to get them motivated to learn. And uh, the this is actually the main part. Uh, we ask them to do kind of research, so we will divide them into groups. One group is to find some history and origin of one cookie, one one kue, and then the other one the ingredients and maybe the uh, uh, what is it? Easy, easy? Nutrition. Nutrition. <laughs> the nutritional content in it, and then where and how usually it is served related to rituals in some particular community, uh, and maybe like. Sinchia that we just had uh, like last week, so they have this special kueh ko, yeah, but yeah, maybe. <laughs> and uh, the other group will compare uh, the results, uh, compare some cookies in one tradition to the other tradition or uh, cultural setting. And the last one, as the assessment to understand, to make sure that they really understand something, we will ask them to create videos or vlogs. They could, they could be just as uh, creative as possible, maybe by interviewing people from some certain uh, cultural background also regarding this traditional queen. I think that's all. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, different perspective, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from language and uh, social awareness. So, all right, last group. <laughs> uh, key goal. <laughs> that, that, that's the signal. All this is about the money. Okay, good uh, afternoon. So, our plan is like a, making a clapon is like a master chef cooking lesson. Okay, so, we want to make the clapon look delicious. <laughs> so, it's like, it's like an elephanting. The traditional platform. So I think it's a new science branding. Wow. <laughs> okay, so the first week we, as usual, we make a session like, uh, do you know what the clapon? Bring the clapon to the class and uh, eat the clapon and just uh, knowing how the clapon looks like. And the second, in the session two, we go to the the master chef looks like class and then we bring the the expert on the how to make a clapon and we are break down the ingredients what flour, what brown and it is anything and, then the, and the next week is we cook the clapon and, and this is the, the unique one is how we make the garnishings how we can promote the clapon, the packaging itself so it looks more delicious so it's a narrow stress we took the lesson. That's it, Pak. Yeah, it's simple. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I, I like that idea. Right? Like different perspective. Yeah. I think nowadays kids, you know, they want to go Starbucks, yeah. almond croissant. So yeah. can we make tripod hip again? Right? Ah, okay. Yeah, with, with like, you know, different skin, different flavors. Yeah, so that's that's another way. We're not quiz. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Uh, I think all of you did great in that short 10 minutes, different perspective. So, this is my evidence here. Right? This is my evidence that today's lab, whatever I did was effective or not effective, right? That means you, you are experts in UDL. The objectives have been met. You have demonstrated that you know what UDL is, right? So, so again, this is the, uh, uh, and it's interesting, you know, how creative all of you can be in such a short time. And so are the kids. When you give them the opportunity, you give them the op options, you give them the writing, you reduce the barriers, uh, the barriers, they can surprise you. They can, right? So, thank you so much. I think that's, that's all for today. Uh, you know, my goal was for you to have a deeper understanding of UDL. Uh, I got it. Oh, you got it. Second was uh, the key principles of UDL. I got it. Three, you also got it. And the last one was for you to practice it in a short activity, which you did. Yes. So it's also done. So the objectives have been met. Yay. Yay. Right? So I. Uh, I, I will uh, I will fix this uh, deck and then I will convert it to PowerPoint yes. Yes. and I, I will send it to you. Yeah. So especially those of you, uh, you know, if you are a head of department, I suggest that you get your team together, maybe go through this with them. Yeah, yeah I think it will be very beneficial because I know not everyone can yeah. be here because of some are part time, some, yeah. I, I, I was told that one of the one of the bigger challenges of uh, here is that you have lots of part-timers. So it's very difficult with quality control, right? So maybe by modifying the content a little bit, don't 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 address the issues. Yeah? So when they are doing text demos, sit down and have a talk with them and say, look, in SU we don't teach like this. Let's fix this. Let me help you. Don't be, go there and say, this is wrong, this is wrong. Say, look, in SU, we do it this way, right? Because we believe based on, we practice in Canvas, we use UDL, right? Let me know how can I help you to fix this. Then help them make some changes, yeah? You cannot change everything, but hopefully, uh, the thing I notice is in some of the classes that will not get a very good grade for me. But even in those classes, I felt that the instructors were very knowledgeable, one. Number two, they have a lot to offer, right? They have industry experience. Some of the things they shared were so useful. I thought, hey, you should have used this as your pivot, you know, not this deck. <laughs> so so they, are, they, are, they are great. It's just that they probably do not know how to do it. Yeah, so uh, did you do the course? I did it because yeah, yeah. No, no, because I don't have time. I just observe. If I want to do that, I have to do it on another cycle. Yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. So do that. You know, I can help you with that. You know, if you want me to have conversations with them regarding this. But I, I understand the challenges, lot, Yeah. But what I want to say is that I saw lots of positive examples. There are some amazing people here that who are not here, but they are here. <laughs> Right, and, and doing these classes, but there's also room for improvement. Right, so some of these things are already in practice, and as you have demonstrated, you clearly know what you you, you know how to do it. So, we wish you uh, a great semester ahead, and thank you so much for making the time to be here. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh,